Okay, so um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Celia Nissens. Um, I uh, am Senior Policy Officer uh, for Agriculture and Food Systems at the European Environmental Bureau and leader of the uh, work package on engagement in the AgriCapture project. Um, the AgriCapture project started uh, nearly two years ago. It's funded by the Horizon 2020 program of the EU. And uh, it is essentially aiming to promote regenerative agriculture, um, both in terms of raising awareness of it uh, and, and having some exchanges between farmers and, and wider uh, sort of practitioners, researchers, businesses, et cetera, around how we can um, scale it up, but also in terms of developing digital solutions that will make it easier uh, for farmers to uh, plan and, and uh, uptake certain regenerative practices, as well as to potentially get uh, rewarded for it financially. Um, and so today uh, is our second annual conference for what we call the European Regenerative Agriculture Community, so a space where we can exchange about regenerative agriculture. And we will be uh, talking first about, uh, about regenerative agriculture. That word is going to be used a lot today. Um, and essentially, uh, I guess the question that we're trying to answer in, in our first session is, is it just a big hype or is there really something behind it? Uh, what are the actual benefits that farmers, uh, the climate and society can, can get from uh, more widespread ad adoption of regenerative farming? Um, that will be moderated by our colleague Callum Bennett from, uh, and Rebecca uh, Davis from LEAF. Um, and then we will have a very short uh, scene setting presentation on the policy context, um, because in the project we believe that um, policies are very important as well to enable and, and, and really boost the adoption of regenerative agriculture. And so we'll have very short presentations on what's going on in the EU and the UK, really just to share some information and set the scene. And the bulk of the event today really is gonna be focused, focused on the work that has been going on in uh, the project to develop the digital solutions that I uh, mentioned earlier, and that will be uh, facilitated by our project coordinators in GI Lab. Uh, and um, with this, um, let me just say that please do interact with us. I, I know that you can't speak uh, and we won't see your faces. Um, it, this was a, a decision that we made in order to uh, make sure that we stick on the timing and that we uh, avoid um, negative experiences with, uh, with hackers or things like that. Um, but we do want to hear from you. So please do uh, post in the chat or in the Q&A and we will be monitoring that very closely. Um, and if you want to engage with us on social media as well, that's very welcome. Uh, you can find the project at uh, on Twitter on uh, at uh, AgriCapture CO2. Um, and I think that's all from me. So uh, Callum, on to you. Thank you, Celia. Uh, so yes, as, as Celia mentioned, uh, this, this first session will be on uh, what benefits uh, farmers and society can get from thriving soils. Um, and it's a pleasure uh, to hand over to the first uh, presenter, Dr. Alistair Leek um, from GWCT uh, in the UK. He's the Director of Policy at GWCT and the Director of the, the Artem Project. Uh, so yes, Alistair, thank you. Okay, hopefully um, you can all see the screen. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Alison Lee. I'm head of the project, uh, the Allison Project. Um, I'm delighted to speak to you this afternoon. I'm actually standing in for my colleague, Joe Stanley, who sadly at short notice has not been able to, to speak to us today. So hopefully I will give his presentation some reasonable justice. So just for some background, a little bit about the Allison Research and Educational Trust. Uh, we were established 30 years ago. We want to demonstrate that uh, productive farming can be combined with healthy soils and wildlife conservation. We have a team of scientists working on the site, 
who are generating the scientific evidence that we need to be able to present to people to convince them that this is a, a good approach to make. And, and finally, a, a session that we'll be covering shortly after this is to look at the importance of using this science to, to benefit other farmers, but also to help shape policies so that we take agriculture in a direction where we continue to produce abundant quantities of affordable food, but we minimize the impact of doing that on the environment. Um, my team here have published uh, over 150 papers between us um, over the last 30 years or so. So there's a really nice body of evidence which we have to build on. And we're going to present some of that evidence to you this afternoon. So when we look at a farm like our one, which is in the, in the middle of England, we are trying to combine uh, producing food, uh, as you see the combine harvester there in the top right hand side of the screen. Uh, down in the bottom left, there's a part of a field that's adjacent to a wood, which is not very good at producing food. So instead we repurpose that land and we turn it into wildlife habitat uh, to, to, to benefit biodiversity. And then in the bottom corner, we are trying to stack uh, different production systems together. So here you can see sheep grazing amongst uh, a small orchard, which is growing apples. And then this is just a, a, not an ordinary orchard, but this is a community orchard. So it is managed by the people who live in the village who harvest the fruit. And what we have there is this triangle, which is where we're trying to achieve the central part where we win on everything. We produce food, we produce an economic return, we look after the soil, we protect the environment of biodiversity, and we involve the people in what we're, what we're doing. So why do farming systems change? Well, farming systems are always under different pressures. Um, in the immediate second post uh, Second World War period, there was a very strong focus across all of Europe on producing more food and being more self-reliant, and all policies really drove us down that route. Uh, we now have to deal with a great deal more than that, uh, because the consequences of some of that have been uh, the loss of biodiversity and the degradation of our soil, and the general de depletion of resources. So this new approach to agriculture recognizes that food production alone cannot be focused upon and that we need to look much more widely at, uh, at how we manage that within the environment. And a number of us involved in the project have been doing this uh, for some time. There are of course negative impacts of food production and here's uh, some produced by ourworldindata.org. Um, you can see that, you know, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, food is not one of the greatest, but as we move to the right of this chart here, you can see that agriculture is having an increasingly, uh, ever increasing impact. So for instance, uh, half of the land use of, of the planet is now uh, under cultivation. Um, outside of uh, rain-fed water systems of, of Europe, which we largely are, certainly in Northern Europe, um, agriculture accounts for a large amount of, of, of water, uh, eutrophication. And when we look at the biomass of, 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 of native or, or natural animals versus those which are farmed, you can see that we have a, a, a huge discrepancy. So, um, all these things are putting pressure on the way that we approach our agriculture and making us re-examine what we do. So one of the main concerns that we have is the degradation of soil. That the loss of soil means the loss of our ability to produce food from it at a time when global population is continuing to rise and we are faced with the, the constraints of, of climate change too. So this graph very eloquently shows what happens, how quickly a soil will be degraded. So if you look at the bottom corner of the, of the chart, You'll, you'll see the brown line, which shows bare unmanaged soil. You'll so sh show the, the blue line, which is perhaps the way we uh, manage soils conventionally now. Uh, and the green line, which is the regenerative approach to, to what we're trying to do. And you can see here that this is predicting that under the regenerative approach, we are going to prolong the life and therefore the productivity of our soil for longer. So this is a very important reason why we need to invest in the way we manage our soils today. 
So here we have the importance of soil set out in a pie chart. And you see that soils deliver ecoservices that literally enable life on earth. Some of these are perhaps less important than others, but the provision of food, fiber and fuel are absolutely critical. And within our diets, with the exception of seafood, pretty much everything else emanates from the soil. So it is absolutely critical to our future uh, well-being. And the key part of soil is the organic matter in it. This is the vegetable material that has come through years of plants growing and decaying in that soil. This is, I literally call it the sunlight of the soil because without the organic matter, the soil is in fact simply dead. It is made up of minerals without any life in at all. It is this carbon, this organic matter in the soil, which feeds absolutely everything, including a number of supporting processes that we're familiar with too. And these can be split into those which are connected with soil structure, uh, water retention, aeration and, and uh, aggregation, and those which are uh, involved in the cycling of nutrients and elements. And all of these connect with ecosystem functions. And the arrows here show that every single one of the things that we're looking at within this project from protecting against erosion to climate change, to water quality, uh, to food production, all link back to soil organic matter. And that is why the agriculture project has focused on soil and soil organic matter and regenerative agriculture as a means of examining that. So why do we need this regen ag approach? Well, we now understand a great deal more about soil cultivation. And what we found is that the more we disturb the soil, the greater the losses of soil carbon and the more degraded the, the soil becomes. Without that sunlight in the soil, the, the soil becomes ever increasingly dead. And so what we're trying to do is to reverse the spiral that we're showing you there, which emanates from intensive tillage um, up the other way. So this is a piece of work which we have been doing at the Allison Project for the last five years. Uh, we've been practicing regenerative agriculture for closer to 30 years, but we didn't really start measuring things properly until the last five years. And we have a sister site, which is a few hundred miles away on a lighter soil type where we'd be doing the same measurements. And what you can see here is some really dramatic changes taking place. Uh, across the farm, with, with large increases on both farms in, in, in bird populations. Uh, we see the soil getting healthier and more earthworms in it. Uh, we see the amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions emanating from the soil dropping, uh, the, the carbon footprint of the management falling. Crop establishment isn't quite so good because it is a bit more of a rough and ready system. But certainly on the lighter so soil, the, the, the yields continue to go up. On our own farm, the yields have fallen a bit, but as you'll see at the end of the, the slide here, the economic impact has not been as severe as, as that 7% reduction. We see some fantastic reductions in the amount of fuel we were using. And bear in mind, the fuel that we're using now is at least twice as expensive as it was when we started the experiment. And we're finding that we can double the speed in which we're establishing our crops. And given how difficult it is under climate change to get crops in the ground in wet autumns, this is very important to be able to put more of the farm into cropping in a shorter space of time. Because we're not moving the soil around, using intensive tillage means we don't need the big horsepower tractors. That means we've been able to, able to cut our investment in machinery. And overall, besides seeing this increase in the in color, eco, ecology of the farm, uh, we're seeing an increase which is extremely significant in the profit, profitability of the farm. And, um, you know, if I want to convince a farmer that this is the way to go, I'm quite sure he'll be reasonably excited about his earthworm numbers going up, but he'll be even more excited to know that he can do that and continue to make a profit and stay in business. So 
Enhancing this organic matter is incredibly important. And one of the things we're, we're trying to avoid doing is, to, 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 is trafficking the land, compacting the soil, because what we find is that when we compact the soil, the, the water doesn't infiltrate properly. We then get problems with runoff and that causes soil erosion. Uh, water that infiltrates the land is there and ready for uh, drought conditions, which gives us greater resilience uh, during periods of uh, dry weather. So as you can see here from my graph, um, as the organic matter increases, so the infiltration rate increases, so the uh, amount of root penetration uh, of the plants improves as well. So everything is going in the right direction when we improve the carbon status of, of our soils. And 1% increase in soil organic matter can store a huge 200,000 litres of extra water per hectare, which is, which is really significant. And if that water is not getting absorbed, then it is simply running off the surface and carrying our soil away with us. So this is our long-term direct drill field, which has now been running, just going into our 13th year, actually. And you can see how, how the earthworm numbers have expanded significantly alongside uh, increasing the organic matter in, in the soil. And this uh, direct drilling approach is one of the key five underlying principles of regenerative agriculture. So we also looked at the healthiness of the soil. I mean, how, how much is the soil breathing? We use that as a measure of how healthy the soil is. As you can see, long-term pasture tends to contain a lot of carbon. So you can see we've got a lot of uh, uh, microbes in there that are, are, are eating the organic matter and breathing. Uh, I'm quite surprised that the wooden's not um, not doing better than that. So we're having a chat with our soil scientist so I can understand why that is. Um, but direct drill is doing a great deal better than we are doing when we compact the soil with the plough. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's an introduction to the work we're doing as part of the Agri Capture Project at the Allerton Project. Uh, back over to you, Callum. Thank you for that, Alistair. That's excellent. Um, and and uh, if anybody has any questions, if you could be adding them to the to the Q and A, and we'll cover those at the end of this session. Um, It'd be great now to hand over to Giovanni, who's a professional agronomist um, and researcher since 2017, uh, and he'll be giving a view of regenerative agriculture from Italy. So thank you very much. Wait a second. Okay, do you see my slides? Yeah, that looks great. Thanks. Okay, okay, perfect. So I will go straight through my presentation, with which I will present to you, which is the path through the carbon smart arable farms um, in the Mediterranean countries. And I will present you where I work, so in the Tuscany, Tuscany region in Italy. So just a brief presentation of myself. Uh, of course, you don't know me. Wait a second. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm an advisor and researcher since 2017, as you can see in the photos, and I'm uh, also working in Santana School of Pisa, which is one of the private universities of Pisa, and uh, I did a PhD in, uh, on agroforestry project, I, I, I finished last year, and currently I'm Arable Crops Hub Coach for the IPM Works project, which I which I will tell you about today. And this is the reason why I was invited and I know Callum, which I thank you for my invitation. And uh, so we are working with local farmers that I will, as I will tell you, and I'm also a non-professional olive grower, just to give you this insight on me. Um, so let's start from the, the situation. So, uh, I think I don't see the, the title of the slide. Well, um, wait a second, no. Uh, well, um, here we are in Tuscany, you see in the red box, we are more or less in, in Tuscany, you see uh, the spot is Pisa, which is the city in which we are working, our university is located. So what about our agriculture? We have soil erosion problems, which is our first enemy in our agriculture, in our arable farms. So uh, 
due to precipitation, wind, the tillage, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a factor also, and basalt for a long time, which is also another factor affecting the soil erosion. We have soils with poor organic matter, so as we are in hot climate, so we are in between one and three percent, sometimes even less, and infrequently clay loam soils, which give us some constraints. We have a, a long dry warm, warm season and which with the precipitation mainly in winter or early spring. And so, and with climate change, the long, the dry periods are getting very long, longer and longer. Uh, in 2022 was really long and more concentrated precipitation, which can give uh, other problems as you can, as you can see. Uh, we have two types of agriculture. We have one agriculture, which is in the hills and which has some constraints and an hour, another agriculture, which is, let's say, easier and richer, <laughs> which is the lowland agriculture. But the two types of agriculture are living together in the same region and very close one to the other. So we have to deal with both. And sometimes for a lot of issues, uh, the two types of agriculture are very similar. Um, we also have another problem because we don't have any more uh, rides in, uh, and we don't have livestock in, uh, in, our, in our farms. We have some livestock farms, but they are scattered and they are not enough. So we don't have low cost soil amendments. So for organic or conventional, we don't have this, this uh, opportunity. We don't, not enough livestock, not enough biogas plants, not bio, no compost production. So we have to uh, improve soil health for agriculture and society through agronomy and without other external input. We, we, can, we, cannot, we don't have them. So we have to scale up good farming practices to get what uh, is our goal. We were already talking in the first presentation before uh, about getting a soil organic matter protection, protection and dimension. So we, we know, we, we already told this before, the soil organic matter makes you always, always a winner because can lower the erosion problems, higher have uh, give you higher soil water retention and higher soil fertility, and of course carbon capture. So this is our project in which we are involved, with, which is IPM Works. And you can see here all the countries involved. Here in Italy, we, have, we are the arable uh, crop hub. Uh, so to give you some details, we have this hub. So a group of farmers we we, we found and we asked them to participate. Uh, we have uh, 12 conventional farms, four organic farms, 16 farms in total. You can see on the map, okay, actually is on the northwest of northwest of uh, of Tuscan, if you know it. Uh, the average average farm size is uh, 260 hectares. You can see we have the old farmers, as as you you may uh, wonder, and uh, we have uh, frequently clay loam soils and no in farm livestock. So you can see on the right we have a typical landscape with. Uh, Durum wheat in the hills, in the middle, maize grown in the lowland, and on the left, we have still in the lowland, fiber hemp. So we have some critical points with this data come from the interviews to all of these farmers. And we have some critical points that have to be solved or we have to deal with it or connected with soil health. So we have simplified rotation and wheat, as you can see, it's on the 43% of the surface of the all arable of this, uh, these farms. And uh, only the 7% of these uh, hectares of our farmers are grown with perennial legumes, of which 6% uh, is alfalfa and just 1% is sulla, which is a species which is uh, very suitable for our uh, environment, but it's not um, used as much as it would be profitable. And some crops are suffering for resistant weeds. So we have Italian ryegrass, above all, and poor weed management in general. So we have also to deal with weed management together with when we, we have when we have to deal with the soil fertility and soil conservation, we also have to deal with weed management because the two things are very connected. And of course, as I as I told, we don't have manure or, or other amendments. And uh, uh, we have the, the fact that the organic farmers do not apply fertilizer at all or almost it's quite common and uh, while the conventional farmers use the mineral fertilizers uh, for example we are working with the 
this arable crops up with actions. Uh, actions, so uh, field trials in directly in farm and connected with them or not connected, some beam events, so explaining something, some good practices for the soil. So for example, our farmers and the, the common practice is to do the classic uh, deep plowing on soils every year or every three, or three to four years. Because with plowing, you can deal with the Italian ryegrass problem and other resistant weeds problem. This is the main reason to use deep plowing, even if farmers know that it's not good for soil. Um, and it's the common practice to do the, this uh, deep plowing in July, in summer, since uh, with the first rain, it's very difficult to get uh, again with the tractor in the field. Uh, but we know uh, because we have clay, clay long soils, so it's difficult. Uh, but we know that uh, do a deep plowing in July is very disruptive for soil organic matter. So we 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 have we wanted to show an on farm experience and to show it in, in the demo event. So to do the substitution. So use again the, the plowing the in soil inversion, but substitute changing it. And in um, so from a business business as usual tillage to change it in the rotation. So for example, doing a plowing, a more shallow plowing as a complementary tillage operation with the new uh, mini plow, which can work up to 20 centimeters, which is, this is the brand, as you can see, it's all black mini, this is the name. So in the, this experience in farm, there were uh, wheat residues left in, left in the field after harvesting, then a cover crop sowing with minimum tillage, tillage. and then again in March, April, we did this, the farmer does this passage with the, uh, this machine, so uh, for soil inversion, but working in a shallow layer, and then doing the warm season crop. So changing the time when you're using the plowing and doing it better for soils. So we also did, this is the, the photos, and we showed to like uh, 15 farmers, and it was a special day to, to show this uh, experience. Um, then we get to another action which are we are pushing, which is implementing implementing intercropping in the arable fields. So basically, what we, do we mean with intercropping the arable is sowing another crop inside the principal crop, so using a companion crop. Uh, with uh, basically we have uh, many techniques to to be used, but the the two categories are, are uh, contemporary sowing, so at the same time the two crops or relay sowing, so after the principal crop establishment. And uh, of course, we have a long, long list of benefits for soil and also for uh, integrated pest management in doing so, because we can have uh, potential benefits, which of course, we sometimes you don't, you don't get all these benefits at one time, but these are the, the goal, which are to produce the two cash crops contemporarily, or improving fertility if you use a, a nitrogen fixing species, or you could occupying the internal space to avoid soil erosion, which is our concern, and compete with uh, weeds, which another is another co concern. And we, if you use perennial, perennial species to get the soil covered, also no favorable moments, which are summer for us. Uh, so we had another project done by our, our university. Uh, was called IWM Praise, and we want to now transfer this in farm, so from research station to in farm directly. Uh, so, for example, we started with uh, uh, this year with uh, an intercropping experiment. Uh, we are in an organic farm in the hills with very heavy soils, uh, very difficult and extreme, let's say, farming conditions. And we had the durum wheat already sown in, in October, quite uh, with a large interrow. And we did the relay intercropping in March and uh, with the shallow hoeing to bury the seed down. So this is a photo of the experience. We was, uh, the experience was good. The, the farmer was uh, uh, liked the, the, the experience, but the, uh, the lentil almost, almost disappeared because this, this uh, the spring was very dry. And so we had a very poor, poor lentil performance. So uh, we know, we understand that water availability is the most limiting factor in for our arable crops in our environment, and we have to do it in another way. So what we did this year, the farmer did not give up, and uh, this October we did the contemporary sowing. Uh, with the idea behind that, if we do the contemporary, we have uh, uh, 
uh, two contemporary crops for a longer period in the, in the year. We have higher soil protection, uh, longer nitrogen fixation cycle, and, and, and so on. So we will see what we will get. Uh, but in the, in the research station, the things went better. So if you can see the photos, and we did a demo event to show it to the farmers. And the farmers were very curious about that. And you can see the photos. And uh, in here it went better because we had more water. So you can see that this is getting more interesting, interesting for, for our farmers. Uh, because this is the idea, this is the scheme. So you have the durum wheat or cereal in general. The, you have the com companion crop. And if you have a perennial, this will uh, survive during the summer and stay on the field. If you have a self-receding or an annual, this, they will die and you will get some nitrogen back in the field. And to do like uh, uh, having a re regenerative practice for, for soil and for soil fertility, especially good where in organic farm, the farmers do not apply or apply very little of fertilizers. And uh, our next, for the next future, we would like to do uh, uh, common wheat and sulla uh, contemporary sowing in organic farm. We are about to do that. We are waiting for rain to stop. And we hope that to do also this in a conventional farm, because it's important also to, to go with these uh, techniques of regener regenerative farming for, um, for uh, conventional farming. And we know from previous experience that alfalfa and white clover are good for doing uh, this uh, intercropping in uh, conventional condition. Uh, so another action we are taking and we are waiting for the results. You can see, sorry for the Italian, on, on the left with the, the strip. So we wanted to do a flower strip in organic farm because this farmer had the field with the uh, uh, with management problems, let's say there was wheat until July 2022, and we have uh, the beehives in this field, so very close. Um, so we wanted to, we asked him to, to do this experiment, to do a flower strip, nine meters large. Uh, we saw um, this uh, uh, one month ago. And so the idea is to have a benefit for, for bees, for biodiversity, and for soil, for soil in the, in the field which was risking to get uh, abandoned this, this year. So uh, having only uh, mowing or very poor revenue or very poor management this year. So we wanted to do uh, something that was good for uh, other aspects and to deliver ecosystem services. And I will tell you also in this case, uh, which will be the results. And uh, another experience for uh, the previous, previous project was uh, no till and herbicides free cropping system for Tuscany. You can see that we did a hairy vetch cover crop in winter. And uh, then directly doing the sunflower seeding in no till and uh, doing the cover crop ter termination, as you can see uh, in the down the arrow on the right with the roller crimper. So in one pas passage doing the uh, cover crop termination and sowing. To sunflower and uh, an article went out from, from my colleagues in, uh, about this and uh, we were quite happy with this uh, with these results and we are trying to making let's say to advertise let's say this uh, this thing to farmers and farmers are very curious about it uh, another option is uh, for livestock farm we are here already in, in again in a very extreme environment because we are in southern tuscany where we, were, we don't have enough water with difficult soils. And uh, this is a strip till cedar prototype for direct sowing on perennial meadows and pastures. So you can leave the, the pasture uh, as it is and then doing the, the directly the seeding. So part, let's say half of the surface is not touched and also no soil disturbance and very beneficial for the soil while keep managing the pasture or the, or the perennial meadows. And this was very interesting and coming from a project in 2017. And the farm still has this, uh, this machine and is using this machine with good results and improving in the usage of this machine. Uh, then we go to the, final, uh, to the final thing to say, which is about agroforestry, because agroforestry, which was the, 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 the subject of my uh, PhD thesis, 
is the what to say so the deliberate integration of woody vegetation into uh, agricultural crop or pasture in the lower story so we can get of course ecosystem services versus trade-offs that we have to manage so you see a lot of in, in this scheme uh, but of course we have the huge potential for carbon sequestration and for the roots of the trees to uh, avoid the erosion and retain the soil and uh, uh, having higher moisture so having a lot of benefits for the soil the full time reforestry and of course the potential is huge for uh, implementing it at landscape scale in, a, in the region or part of the region uh, so of course i cannot go deep in the, explaining you these different uh, um, uh, systems but the project agromix is going on on uh, from my colleagues so you can have a look uh, in the site of the project so uh, we have uh, uh, let's say the two categories you know the silvarable systems for uh, lowland areas so we did like poplar and arables uh, and uh, uh, see, yes poplar and arables in two different schemes in lowland in our research station in pisa and then in farm with livestock farms the silver pastoral systems for the hilly areas the internal areas we have uh, has to be uh, has to manage the the livestock also with the with trees and uh, so we have the one farm which do is doing the uh, simple pastoral system inside the woods inside the forest so grazing inside the forest and then another project about adding the trees in uh, usually as you can see in the photo down right very dry areas with uh, when everything in summer is uh, is uh, very yellowish and not alive so adding this tree which can use as uh, uh, shading and also for fodder for the sheep grazing um, so i'm done i hope that i did not steal too much time and these are my contacts and you can follow us on uh, these pages and thanks for the attention thank you giovanni that's brilliant um we'll just do a few minutes of q a now uh, so if anybody does have any no it's okay it's great um and we'll just do a few minutes of q a now uh, so we'll go through and if anybody does have anything else then just uh, make sure to add it into the q a section okay. um so the first one first question i think was would probably be suitable to direct to both of you um so do you believe that direct drilling can be applied under all climatic conditions if not please explain where it could be applied uh, so if, if alastair you'd like to start with that uh, yeah certainly i'm not familiar with uh, all climatic conditions but i'm hoping there's some people from the project that have different climate to us we're, we're obviously northern europe we're in a maritime climate um, I think the point I make here is it's not necessarily the climatic conditions in the UK that limit the ability for farmers to practice uh, no tillage. It's actually the soil types. Um, so roughly putting it, um, those soils which are very sandy and those which are very heavy clays do not respond well to zero till. Anything in between, so a sandy clay loam or a sandy loam or um, a silty clay, they will all uh, direct drill okay. But those two extremes of the sand and the clay on either side are, are too challenging. Well, uh, about, about our environments, let's say it, it is suited to our all environments. Let's say that we, we have the, since for example, for cereals is uh, quite, uh, it's not that difficult to do direct drilling because we have uh, when doing the, the sowing, we can uh, wait for rains and uh, you have water enough for germination. So it's not a problem. There were a lot of farmers did it. The problem is more on weed management because you can't control uh, the, the weeds. Of course, as Alastair, Alastair said, there are some extreme soils that are not so, so, so suited for direct drilling, but it, all these other types of soils are Quite okay, and uh, we have it's more problematic in the hills. So where and where I have clay loam soils in the hills, where the, the the fields are not fair and not not even. So this is uh, mainly a problem. So we don't have we have machines for doing minimum tillage while uh, so direct drilling, let's say, but it's not properly a, 
noting system. So they are machines that are quite are more aggressive on the soil and they perform uh, sowing with the, but soil has to be tilled at least in the shallow layers because otherwise it's very different. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think you've you've just kind of partially covered this, Giovanni here, but um there's a question here as well. So is, what are the, the no tillage impacts on pest management? So I think you've just you covered that in part, but if yeah. you've got anything to add to that. Yeah, if you want to hear a story from here, from Tuscany, is that, uh, uh, for example, um, some of the farmers, the, the, say the pioneers, the best, started with the direct drilling and the sod seeding of uh, wheat uh, in the 80s, so quite a long time ago. And there was a, a, a push to, to switch to direct drilling and sod seeding. But they had to stop and start again doing this plowing every three to four years or to not use the, the sod seeding, seeding or uh, leaving the machine or selling the machine or keeping the machine, but leaving it only for like the 10, 20 hectares in the farm, which are more suitable for sod seeding. Because we have this problem of uh, population of uh, Italian rigenas, lolium, so different species of lolium, which are, have a free type of resistance. So even to glyphosate. So three families of three groups of herbicides. So this was a huge problem and uh, for weed management. And also, since you can control on cereals, uh, a lot some farmers also stopped to do topped to do rapeseed to grow rapeseed because it's very, on, on lolium it's can suffocating uh, rapeseed, and so we have we lost one one of the few crops we had in the rotation. So it's kind of a huge problem, and we are trying to targeting it. In our project, but of course it's a long, uh, long story. Will not solve the issues in a few, a few years. Yeah, and then there's so there's just one last question, and we'll fit it in quickly before we pass on to the next session, so that we've covered all of the questions. Um, so the last one, Giovanni, was somebody asking um, uh, on the topic of of the lack of organic matter sources in your region. Um, are there other ways from other sectors like sewage sludge or food waste that could be used to build organic matter? Well, yeah, they, they could be used, but we still have, uh, well, there's a, pro a huge problem in delivering of whatever uh, mm -hmm. amendment you produce, delivering it in the, 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 only in the large area and the sp spraying, uh, spreading it on, on the fields, which are quite big because as I showed you, the average is 260 hectares, some as 500 hectares. So maybe they can do it, but relatively they have to choose a, a smaller amount of hectares on which to spread the, the other, uh, let's say the amendments, the manure, the whatever, even if you find it. And also you don't have, uh, so this can be a problem. And also we had also another problem, which is, goes beyond agronomy agriculture which is uh, that uh, the population doesn't like uh, uh, to see these uh, sewage larger or other yeah. other other kind of things in the fields and like people filming uh, um, with the phone uh, the farmers doing so or uh, since the houses and the settlements are very close to agricultural fields complaining because of the of the smell Mm -hmm. And so this, I, we, this is quite complicated. But yeah, no, no, it always really is a really complicated, complicated issue. issue. Mm. So I just, I just like to thank both of the speakers for this session again. Thank you for, for taking the time and thank you for a really interesting presentation from both of you. Um, and now um, I'll just pass over uh, to the next session, which will be uh, all about the policy landscape for carbon farming in the EU and in the UK. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yuri Krajic. I'm the policy officer for land and climate here at the European Environmental Bureau. I hope you can see my presentation. I'm very happy to be here with you today to walk you through a little bit of the EU policy context on, uh, on carbon farming. So very broadly speaking, the idea of carbon farming stems from the European Green Deal. This is one of the key priorities of the current European 
Commission in an attempt to increase the EU's climate ambition, for example, to preserve and restore ecosystems and biodiversity, um, to create fair, healthy, environmentally friendly food systems, and to leave no one behind in this just transition. So in, in, this, uh, in this effort, and especially in an effort to increase the EU climate ambition and to boost uh, carbon removals from the atmosphere, um, the European Commission will publish a legislative proposal on the certification of carbon removals, which should be published tomorrow. And we're looking, uh, we're looking, uh, in, uh, we're looking currently into that. Um, so the aim, according to the European Commission, the objectives of this particular piece of legislation will be to boost carbon removals, so to upscale carbon farming, to foster new value chains for the capture and storage of carbon, and to create a common EU standard for the certification of carbon removals. Um, the, this carbon removal certification scheme framework will define three types of certified removals. One is carbon farming, so increasing carbon stock in, in land use through land management practices. The second one will be permanent storage, which basically covers everything about the industrial solutions for carbon capture and storage. And the third one will be carbon storage in long lasting products and materials. Now at this stage, these three categories are not further defined. So there is no kind of like a, a positive or a negative uh, list of carbon farming practices. And this will have to be defined further down the line. Um, all carbon removal activities will have to prove that they have, they have no negative impact on sustainability objectives, some of which are, for example, protection and restoration of ecosystems, climate change adaptation, uh, pollution prevention, transition to circular economy, and similar, uh, and similar objectives. Um, now, this carbon removal certification framework will create certificates that will state the amount of carbon stored through a certain carbon remo removal activity, but it is currently yet unclear uh, what the intended use of the generated certificates is. It is hinted, though, it has been hinted, though, that um, the carbon, that this scheme will create, will be creating carbon credits. Uh, for sale on voluntary carbon markets for offsetting purposes. Um, earlier this month, a provisional agreement has been reached um, between the European Parliament, the Council and the European Commission on the new LULUCF and the new EU LULUCF target, land use, land use change and forestry, uh, which is increased to uh, 310 megatons of CO2 equivalent of sinks by 2030 in the land sector. And it is currently unclear how and to what extent this particular carbon removal certification will also support this target. Another important piece of legislation that is um, related to carbon, that has links to carbon farming is the upcoming soil health law. In the EU soil strategy for 2030, that was published last November, the Commission announced that they will publish a, a legislative proposal, another law on soil health, which is expected in second quarter of 2023 of next year. And some of the, of the obje objectives of this soil health law are, for example, restoration of carbon rich soils, uh, achieving good soil health in the EU by 2050, um, determine options and rules for monitoring of soils and therefore certain carbon farming aspects such as increasing, um, increasing uh, soil organic carbon in soils, for example, uh, could be very well addressed in the upcoming soil health law. Uh, finally, I would like us to touch upon the nature restoration law, which was uh, also published this year. It does not by, uh, by itself talk about carbon farming or increasing carbon stocks, but it does set out specific targets for restoration of ecosystems, such as certain percentage of drained peatlands to be restored, for example, or restoration of forest ecosystems, 
or restoration of grassland ecosystems, which means that carbon farming activities could very well support also the targets set out in this nature restoration law. So this was very briefly about the EU policy context, and I will hand over the floor now to Alistar, who will give us a short overview of the UK situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yuri. Um, I have no slides to share because my uh, intervention is going to be very brief. Um, so in terms of policy on carbon in the UK, this is largely driven by our Committee on Climate Change, which has set out certain milestones which we need to achieve as society by 2050 in order to reach net zero. And I think it's fair to say that these are proving very challenging for our government to, uh, to grapple with. So, for instance, as part of uh, reshaping our policy uh, landscape in a post-EU uh, period, uh, we've brought forward two significant bills to uh, Parliament uh, in the UK. One is an agriculture bill and the other is an environment bill, neither of which had any mention of soils in them. This is despite the fact that the Committee for Climate Change have made it clear that to reach net zero, we will have to rely on soils in, in taking up some of our carbon. Indeed, it's nice, Yuri, to be reminded that the uh, EU does have a, a soils health law coming up because we were only able to extract a soil health action plan consultation uh, from our government, um, which is actually yet to be, yet to be launched. Uh, recently, a colleague told me that there were 66 different carbon calculating schemes currently available in the UK for various aspects of, of carbon uh, calculation. Uh, and certainly, of all the things that you can calculate carbon on, soil is probably one of the most challenging. And this is particularly because the carbon which can be stored in soils depends on the soil type, uh, the rotation that the farmer is practicing, uh, the climate and the type of tillage which is being used. And we're very fortunate to have some excellent historic data from the Rothamsted Research Station, which is 180 years old next year, which allows us to look at what happens to pools of carbon in different types of soils under uh, different management regimes. And this sh should help us to underpin some decent science in establishing um, some soil carbon codes. At the moment, there are some soil carbon codes out there. Uh, there's very little verification. Uh, many farmer advisors are advising their farmers against trading carbon at this point in time. I think that's probably very wise. Um, there is a suggestion that moving forward, farmers would be well advised to be selling carbon along with their crops to the food chain and in setting the carbon within the system rather than trading it out as offsetting. Although I'd note with some alarm that some of our retailers are suggesting that it will be a condition to trade to sell food to retailers in the future, that farmers will need to be carbon neutral. Um, so that's something to, to look, away, uh, look out for. And finally, um, government is really trying to avoid regulation, uh, trying to leave it to the free market. And as a result, that market is very undeveloped and very uncertain. Um, some great news from the agriculture project is a small group of us are working on the earth observation data which has been provided to establish a methodology for sampling soil carbon, which is relatively cheap, uh, effective, uh, not too time consuming, but will help to give good data. And I hope to be able to report on that uh, when we convene at a later date. Um, so thank you very much. Um, that's me finished, but obviously open to any questions. Thank you, Alistair. Um, there doesn't seem, uh, yeah, I do see a question here for, for Yuri, uh, although we might not be able to answer those questions because we are not the commission, uh, but we'll just very quickly take um, these few questions now and then uh, move on to the 
the big part of, of today's agenda, so uh, led by GI Lab um, about the digital services provided by AgriCapture. So Yuri, on to you, and then Davide, you can take over from there. Thanks a lot, Celia. So I see uh, in Q&A session, I see the uh, uh, question about carbon removal certification and whether growers would need to accomplish a whole carbon life cycle assessment of the farm. Um, well, this would be actually a question for the commission. We are not, uh, I, I, I don't have the sufficient information to answer that. But of course, it would be a very good idea, in my opinion, that if we are talking about certific certificating a certain removal, that we take into account all the associated, so it should be a net removal, an actual removal from the atmosphere, and net of all associated emissions, and also that would avoid carbon leakage, with me, which means provoking emissions, for example, elsewhere, even outside the scope of the project. But that's, unfortunately, I think that's the most I can answer at this point. Um, second question, I would like to hear about upfront payment for carbon credits and also about when a credit origin, and also about when a credit originated from carbon farming can be retired. Um, yeah, well, uh, there is a big discussion going on how carbon farming should be paid for and whether it should be upfront or practice-based or result-based. Uh, it appears that the commission is going for a result-based scheme, which would be partly also remunerated through voluntary carbon markets, which, as we have heard already, are um, uh, volatile and uh, sometimes uncertain. Um, but the discussion about how the payments should be made is far from being finished, I think. So I th you should I, I, I advise you to stay tuned because after the pro public the proposal is out tomorrow, I'm sure that there will be a lot of discussion about that as well. Uh, do you really think that insetting is a better deal for farmers than offsetting? Sounds like a price premium. These disappear fairly quickly according to history. I'm not sure whether that's an uh, whether that's a, a question for me or probably more for Alistair. Yes, if I can just speak quickly to that one. Um, as a farmer, I like the idea of when I sell a ton of grain to make breakfast cereal, I also trade some carbon with that and it's done in partnership with my customer. This locks my customer into buying my wheat uh, rather than buying it from somewhere else where there are no uh, credible uh, accounting systems for, for the carbon. Um, I really see this as a, a stimulus for better partnership working with retailers and the food supply industry, rather than everything just being traded on the lowest possible price. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take one last, uh, one last question. It's about uh, carbon farming, no? Okay, disappeared. Sorry, Sorry, Yuri, I just answered yeah. uh, in writing. That's, oh, okay, perfect. We just don't know. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. So thank you very much. Um, and I'm hang handing the floor over to Davide to introduce the next session. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope that you can hear me well. Uh, I'm very glad today to be here as part of the project management team and to present you the technological platforms and tools that have been developed and are being developed during the agriculture project. Uh, we'll have five short presentations uh, of about four to five minutes. After each presentation, we will uh, take your questions and hopefully answer uh, to some of them. Uh, in any case, you can also contact the presenters afterwards uh, for uh, further details. Uh, I would immediately hand the floor uh, to Dragutin Protic um, for the Soil Passport uh, tool. Uh, Dragutin. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Davide. I am Dragutin Protic, and I'm CEO of uh, Gilab Company from Belgrade. We are coordinator of AgriCapture project, and uh, we are developing some technical solutions. Uh, which I will be very glad to present to you at the moment. So I hope you can see uh, my screen. First, I will start with uh, how we develop technology that uh, are uh, aimed to supporting uh, carbon credits. 
so uh, at the moment, uh, there are a number of standard organization that uh, actually offers possibility to generate carbon credits from regenerative agriculture. But uh, the, the registration of carbon credits uh, are, is a, a very, very complex uh, process. Uh, each organization actually provide methodology or methodologies uh, uh, that uh, define the rules for uh, a carbon credit project. We are currently focused on uh, uh, VERA methodology 42, and we are closely working with uh, One Carbon uh, World um, uh, company that uh, promotes the Great British Sustainable Farming Project. Uh, may I say that uh, it is uh, uh, the project that is the most advanced uh, in, in uh, generating carbon credits from uh, regenerative uh, agriculture. So, uh, a carbon credit, credit registration process uh, generally consists of several stages. The first, the first stage is done by project developer who um, creates a PDD or a project design document, which is basically description of the project and the methodology and how it will be implemented. It should be validated by an external uh, independent auditor. Uh, then uh, during the implementation of the carbon credit pro uh, process, um, uh, a verification takes place, also done by auditor, uh, which verifies that uh, everything is uh, uh, according to, to the documentation agreed uh, uh, in the beginning. And finally, carbon credits are registered by standard organization and can be uh, sold or retired. Uh, so basically, a uh, project developer or project proponent, which is uh, the official term from the company who basically manages uh, a project. Uh, so project developer has to submit a, a number of reports during this process, number of reports and documents, and everything to auditors and to standard organization. And that's uh, where we come uh, with uh, te technology uh, to support uh, the process. Uh, we provide means to the project developer um, that can be used in this um, reporting and uh, uh, providing the documentation to the, to the auditors and to the standard organization. For example, for applicability conditions, uh, which include, uh, for example, changes to pre-existing practices uh, have to be have to exist. Uh, mm, uh, the, the land that is part of the project uh, must be cropland grassland within ten years period prior to the start of the project. Uh, there is no possibility that wetlands or native ecosystems are cleared. Uh, to uh, to to uh, agricultural start at that place, so we are using uh, various sources, reliable, uh, well-proven sources from from uh, other parties like Copernicus Services, or we generate our own products uh, that actually provides evidence that these applicability conditions are. Um, uh, are there for for the for the uh, fields that are part of the projects, and finally, uh, we produce automatically a report that is sent to uh, the project developer, and which the project developer can include to the documentation that. Uh, is to be sent to the auditors of our standard organization. Or during monitoring, reporting, and verification process during the implementation of the project, or to check uh, um, uh, additionality uh, of the project, uh, there is need uh, for uh, uh, management. Um, 
types to be uh, verified. And we do it again uh, by using uh, earth observation in a highly automatic way. For, for example, uh, farmers can declare uh, historical and current info on if uh, they used uh, crop type, uh, uh, which crop type they used. So is there rotation or uh, which tillage uh, was applied? Um, have they used cover crops? Have they um, left residues uh, where they're burning residues? Uh, maybe. So we actually uh, check what uh, has been de uh, declared by farmer, or if it, nothing uh, has been declared by farmer, we anyway produced uh, the information from uh, 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 earth observation. And we do it for uh, current year and for the uh, several year backwards. Uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very simple and easy to, to read way. And again, a report uh, is generated uh, for the project developer. Uh, because soil sampling is essential to uh, monitor the carbon sequestration, sequestration of uh, soil organic carbon, um, we use uh, a methodology defined through the Soil to Carbon project uh, in, in the UK, um, which uh, states that uh, sampling should be done within uh, management zones, uh, five to 15 sampling points for management zones, and there should be possibility to uh, revisit uh, these points uh, uh, every several years. So, we are producing productivity maps and management zones maps to the farmers so they can go and uh, do soil samplings uh, based on that uh, uh, standard methodology. Uh, also, because we realized uh, from uh, the two years of the project and uh, farmers experience that there is a need for a very simple mobile application for soil sampling that uh, will uh, navigate farmers to the location for sampling where uh, they can uh, record easily rec uh, location, but on notes and comments uh, uh, in a simple form, they can do um, also there is a functionality to, to take uh, geotagged photos for um, further evidence of what was going on there. And uh, the download and uh, share uh, the stored information should be uh, very uh, uh, simple and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, easy to use by the, by the uh, farmers, but also for the project developers and anyone who, who would use this uh, information. So this was a quick presentation of uh, uh, the technology uh, models that support uh, carbon uh, credit projects. Uh, so the question is, uh, should I continue with, uh, with a soil passport because that is the next uh, topic? Or should we go with uh, questions and answers first and then move to that? Um, uh, as we have got several questions, I would say that uh, okay. we can answer a few of them and then uh, uh, we can move to the next presentation. Uh, so regarding the first present, the first question uh, we have here, isn't the VM0042 method under revision? Um, I've heard that too, yeah, but um, at the moment, uh, the, the current version is still valid, so we are working according to that methodology. Okay, regarding the second question, are you able to monitor changes in the uh, SOC with the satellite measurements only? Uh, some companies such as uh, Bumitra are already proposing a service to measure soil data with satellite without any actual soil sample. 
uh, they can use it uh, within the VCS, VCS standard? No, that's the simplest way to answer. No, it is not possible to, well, I'm not aware and it's not logical to, to use only satellite measurements to quantify soil gun carbon. Yeah, so say basically it's a limitation that uh, yeah. uh, we believe cannot be overcome at the moment. <laughs> Anyway, um, if you if you use optical uh, imagery, it only scans the 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 the, the, the surface of the land. Uh, you cannot estimate the, and uh, even then, it should be uh, completely bare land, and that's not really what the farmers should should do to leave the land to soil totally bare. That should be avoided, <laughs> according to the uh, philosophy of regenerative agriculture. Um, okay, mm. John asks, are existing regenerative practices, for example, organic excluded from uh, support? I'm not sure exactly. I'm not, yes, I don't really understand the question. Yeah, I'm also, um, is it regarding additionality i'm not sure if you can specify or send us an email i think we can provide you with a better answer uh we will take okay last two um last questions because we need to move uh, forward um for draguting apart from uh soil sampling which is rather costly and time consuming do you also quantify soil organic carbon storage with other approaches such as modeling and if yes how I think we will also have yes, there are models afterwards. to do that, but uh, I don't think uh, that is the best way to go uh, because uh, all models uh, um, uh, brings lots of uncertainty to the. Uh, but I I don't agree that uh, that soil sampling should be costly and time consuming. So as uh, Alistair mentioned, we are working on a methodology which will not be. Uh, costly and time consuming, but still be reliable and uh, um, let's say um, uh, limit uncertainty about the quantification of uh, soil carbon. Okay, I suggest to move to the um, next uh, presentation. There are still several questions we will see at the end if we have time to answer them all or if uh, you can contact us by email for further uh, answers. Rukutin, the floor is yours for the soil passport technology. And again, thank you very much, Davide. Uh, uh, before I explain what do we mean by soil, soil passport, let me say something about the context. So uh, the, the importance of uh, the soil for life on Earth, uh, you, you heard from the wonderful uh, presentation done by, by Alistair today. Um, uh, well, I, I will start with uh, uh, that soil is an asset, so it has certain value. So it, it comes mostly from its ability to produce food, but in recent years, uh, soil also can produce carbon credits and that is certain value. So uh, there are two uh, main questions about the soil that should be answered. How has the soil been treated through the, through the time, through the, yes, through the history? And what are the results of uh, these treatments now? Uh, so soil passport uh, solution uh, aimed to provide answers to, to these questions. So. Uh, for the basic version of soil passport, uh, we use uh, satellite data, so earth observation data, but also farm records that exist so farmers can provide. Uh, and these, these records uh, can be easily imported in, in soil passport uh, system. Uh, so, oh, we would like to present the declared and verified application of agricultural practices. Uh, for example, no or reduced tillage, cover crops, crop rotation, agroforestry, crop residues, uh, 
left uh, on the surface and no burning. But also the information on uh, fertilizers, application, yield, plant protection, full consumption, and uh, of course, soil analysis uh, data if uh, they exist. Uh, we want to present it in a simple standard, standardized uh, way, uh, easy to read and understand by the users. So uh, we are also uh, uh, showing uh, historical data and uh, it uh, would look like uh, the service book for your WeHile. So if you trade with land or if you want to learn something about la uh, land, you can easily do by looking at uh, uh, this kind of uh, information that is um, summarized in one uh, way and presented in a really meaningful, nice way. Uh, Soil Passport Plus version is uh, uh, an advanced version that uh, provides information uh, on the effects of management practices. Uh, and when I say that, I mean uh, in terms of uh, soil health and speaking about soil health, uh, we, um, we are consulting the method methodology defined by Agriculture and Horticulture De Development Board. Uh, from the UK. So we are talking about soil organic carbon, uh, PA, uh, chemical properties of the soil, biological properties of the soil, compaction and uh, soil structures. Uh, but then uh, what are the effects of management practices uh, on fuel consumption, on fertilizers application, uh, and uh, of course related to that nutrient use efficiency, and uh, finally, uh, on extreme weather resilience. So how the soil is weather resilient. Um, again, soil sampling is very important uh, to provide, uh, to, to collect uh, all, all the data uh, that should uh, uh, speak about the effects of the management practices on soil health. So as I said, it should be done in a standardized way. Uh, again, uh, we are uh, we based our approach to the uh, monitoring soil carbon practical field farm and lab guide uh, document uh, from the soil to carbon project. Uh, it should not be a burden to a farmer, neither a financial way uh, or uh, an effort, a time, so um, it should not be time consuming or, or costly. And uh, uh, the optimal locations are based on uh, management zones, um, technology which is based on, I already explained in the previous uh, section. And uh, it should be delivered to the users as a simple uh, summary, uh, but also details on demand. Uh, it should present current state, but also long-term trends and uh, uh, a functionality, which is very important, uh, would be easy to gen uh, generate and download reports from all the data. And uh, how it can be useful? Uh, well, farmers can understand their soils and potential problems much better uh, having this kind of um, application. Uh, but it can also increase value of the land because it will facilitate land market. And finally, it can be basis for carbon credits or other environmental or climate friendly agriculture supporting uh, schemes. We are looking forward to see the uh, new EU uh, proposal for legislation that will be published tomorrow. Thank you, Yuri, for sharing that info with us. So we are, uh, we are really happy to see it tomorrow and see how 
all this technology actually fit uh, what will be going on in, in the EU next years. And thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dragutin, again um, for this interesting presentation. Uh, there is only one question uh, regarding the second presentation. Um, and it's about, is this soil passport a service report free of cost? Well, we still don't know the business model for this because it's in a developing stage. So, so we will be able to answer uh, that question in a few months, I guess. Yeah. Uh, then I would move immediately to the next presentation, that it's the Carbon Farming Potential Calculator. Uh, please try to fit in the five minutes so that um, we make sure that everybody will be able to present and that we will finish in time. Perzemek? Yes. Uh, can you see me and hear me? I can. Okay. Um... I can see the presentation now. Yeah. Can you see it in the full screen now? Uh, not yet. I don't see it in presentation mode. Okay. Um, sorry. So it looks like we're gonna uh, lose half a minute. Um, I'll try to um, share my whole screen. Then. Can you see the full screen now? Yeah. No, it's in presentation mode. Okay. Great uh okay so uh you know we've been uh doing this project for for uh, almost two years now and um and uh some of us are in the subject uh for for a long time um but uh, i think all of us would agree that regenerative agriculture is is a fairly is, is actually a very complex uh, interdisciplinary matter and um, um, the um, Reg Agri Potential Explorer is is is, uh, is the tool um, which uh, aims to um, just try to simplify uh, the this matter um, in a reasonable way um, to help uh, farms and, and other actors uh, to understand better, um, you know, what's in it uh for me and obviously uh the, the the end goal is to generate um you know save some emissions uh have some extra carbon in the soil and then maybe also um earn money in the process so um so this uh regularity potential explorer um we develop it uh, with a bit of help uh, um of bnp paribas uh the beta version has been published recently uh but i think the the next version that will appear in january is, is going to be uh kind of um mature enough to be to be fully proud of uh and the idea is uh, well I, i'll just um reiterate the goals which are written here um to estimate the potential uh, of regagri uh, to redu reduce farms' carbon footprint, um, to educate uh, on on the subject matter, um, and very importantly, to aid understanding of relative importance of factors determining the potential. Uh, okay, we, for example, you know, don't want the farm uh, who has uh, crops on very poor soil. Uh, some some sons to expect that you know there could be some amazing uh, gains uh, of, of of many tons of uh, carbon per year. There are some obvious uh, facts which can be put together uh, to quickly estimate um, an individual farm's uh, potential, um, and the tool is in the form of um, the um internet service with an api uh, so uh, we have the first uh, online interface but in fact the idea is that anybody can connect and have their own uh, interface um, 
And uh, going back to the goals, uh, to the list here, uh, it's important for us to be transparent, um, to link to all the sources. Uh, the sources, you know, the constellation changes, there are some new findings every couple of months. So an internet service uh, is, is actually a really nice, uh, a very appropriate form um, uh, for, for a dynamic um, uh, subject like this. Um, uh, let me say a few more words that there is um, a focus. Uh, it's, it's linked to, uh, to what we do in Satagro. Um, we specialize in precision treatments. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to point out that uh, precision farming is, uh, in our opinion, an important part of regenerative agriculture. Uh, in the typical case of industrialized crop farming, nit nitrogen fertilizer use typically constitutes the biggest part of uh, carbon footprint. Uh, then uh, roughly between half and 2% of, of uh, this uh, nitrogen fertilizer is turned into nitrous oxide, uh, which is very potent greenhouse uh, gas. Uh, and because of its really high global warming potential, uh, even though it's, it's a relatively small amount, uh, the, the carbon footprint of it is, is equal or greater, greater of, of other uh, emissions linked to fertilizer use. So any, any activity on the farm that can reduce the amount of fertilizer use is going to have a significant impact on the carbon footprint. And, this is just a slide which shows how our understanding of the relationship between the fertilizer use and the mission has been changing. The, uh, the green line is the tier one IPCC approach where the nitrous oxide emissions are just calculated at just 1% of all fertilizer use. But then you have these uh, you know, curvy approaches, uh, which are much more favored recently. Uh, we start to understand that actually higher dosage uh, causes increasingly uh, higher amount of emissions. And uh, I would like to propose that, uh, I mean, there's, there is an increasing amount of evidence that, you know, this, these high emissions are linked to the mismatch between the, the need, crops need for fertilizer and what the crop actually gets. Um, and that in fact, uh, the, the relationship between um, nitrogen doses and nitrous oxide emissions uh, could very much depend on, on the amount of excess. Uh, um, so this is why here we, we want to focus on the promotion of verbal rate application uh, because um, if the fertilizer is spread um, uh, according to crops need, uh, then uh, this uh, helps to um, keep the emissions in the in this first regime that shows sh that is shown on this uh, on this graphic uh, from Kim et al. Um, where you know when there is no excess, then the relationship is more linear. When there is excess. Uh, then it becomes uh, exponential. Um, Sorry, I have to ask you to wrap up as uh, fast as you yeah, can. Yeah, no worries. I'm I'm wrapping up. Uh, this is this is in fact the last slide. I just wanted to uh, point out this because I think it is interesting and it's fairly cutting edge. Um, we everybody's talking about um, uh, rewarding farms for uh, different activities. Uh, but not necessarily for precision agriculture. Um, we don't go really beyond a general uh, fertilizer management plan. Um, hence, they need to, to talk about this and uh, the effect of verbal uh, rate application are going to be uh, part of uh, the next version of Reg Agri Potential Explorer. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Perjama. Um... There are no questions related to this presentation. Uh, please, if you have any questions or you're taking your questions, you can still add them on the chat and we can answer afterwards. Uh, otherwise, I would give you the floor back for the second presentation on the profitability calculator. And um, yeah.
please, if you can fit in five minutes, that would be great. Yeah, maybe even less. Uh, so, um, mapping of uh, profitability uh, on the farm is uh, is important for for a number of reasons. But let me first say that um, it has been a, a holy grail um, uh, in um, in agriculture agriculture for for a long time because it's um, it's a very complex uh, operation which uh, requires linking information from many aspects of farm's functioning. And, and then we also need to remember that uh, during crop cultivation, everything is very, very dynamic. So we created a tool which uh, allows uh, this dynamic uh, mapping uh, of profitability. Um, and um oh, sorry um here I, I want to talk about a bit about this and explain uh why um, um why uh precision agriculture uh can turn into higher profits and high yields and it can uh, lower emissions and uh lower pollution um this is just a, a little graphic uh, showing how um, a satellite image with a with a calculated vegetation index is turned into uh, fertilizer prescription maps, with, uh, which allows to um, feed the, the crop locally uh, in a, with doses uh, appropriate for for the local condition. And um, all of uh, these uh, special effects, uh, special differences can be put together uh, into a set of maps, which in the end uh, allow to see uh, profitability. Um, here we have two examples. Uh, in both examples, on the left, there is a map of uh, all costs. And then below there is a list of these costs. Uh, in the middle, there is a map of profit, which is basically yield uh, times the price achieved uh, from the yield. And the, the last map is, is just the, you know, uh, the, the division, the subtraction of, uh, of costs from, uh, from, from the profit, uh, from the income, sorry. Um, so the last map is profitability map. And here you have the comparison between two cases where the case on the, uh, on the left is the one without any uh, verbal rate, uh, without any precision treatments, uh, or precision agriculture aspects implemented on the farm. And uh, on the middle map, you can see uh, because the, the yield was mapped that there is actually a variability in the productivity of the land. So when there are different inputs uh, to different places of this crop field uh, um, where, where the amount of uh, input is the same, uh, but the output actually varies in space, then we have this strange relationship uh, um, which is uh, shown on the on the plot here that for different uh, costs uh, for the same cost we actually have uh, a very different profit uh, so there's no pretty much no relationship between cost and profit whereas with the case uh, on the right um, we can uh, make the relationship between cost and profit much more rational uh, and at the same time, uh, the overall profitability increases. The, the, uh, in this case, the amount of costs is the same, but because of the, uh, the inputs locally, uh, especially fertilizer requirements, were much better uh, with crop requirement, uh, then uh, it, it allowed to increase uh, yield somewhat by around 10%. And on the on the plot, you can see that there is a, a much more rational relationship between uh, the cost uh, and profit because this is how it should be. 
if uh, the soil has a large potential, uh, it can uh, bear um, a lot of yield, then this yield uh, needs uh, more food um, and uh, there the should be a, a, a directly proportional relationship between the inputs and outputs. Um, and obviously, the better match uh, between dosage and yields, as it was said before, uh, means that no fertilizer is uh, or less fertilizer is lost, uh, which means not only smaller greenhouse gas emissions, but also smaller, smaller leakage uh, to ground and surface waters. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have got uh, three questions. Um, so for the profitability mapping, is there a minimum field size needed to use this approach? Um, in practice, uh, since we started using uh, data from Planet Labs uh, with resolution uh, three meters, the um, minimum crops, uh, crop field size decreased to around one, one hectare. Uh, in, in such a crop field, especially if it's kind of, uh, you know, squarey shape, uh, we can already see some variability in, uh, in its productivity. And then it, it makes uh, sense to produce a map like this. Okay, thank you. Um, then we have uh, another question. Um, have you looked at the nitrogen use efficiency for various organic amendments, not synthetic nitrogen? Uh, no, we have not. But from literature, um, uh, one can learn that the story is basically the same. The, the, the key factor is, uh, is into what extent uh, the provision of nitrogen matches crops requirement at the moment. Um, if there's too much, then also organic amendments uh, cause emissions. The, the famous 1% uh, linear relationship for tier one IPCC, this applies uh, as much to uh, synthetic fertilizers as to organic uh, ones, as far as I'm concerned or important. Thank you for the answer. We have two more questions. The first one, uh, what are the costs of production based upon uh, synthetic nitrogen, availability of organic amendment from on farm? Uh, are there any mixed farms included in this project that include both crops and livestock? Yeah, so, well, this is a good question, but a, <laughs> a fairly complex one. Yeah, I think it totally makes sense to, uh, to use your own uh, organic uh, fertilizer if you if you have one, and we have several clients uh, which use primarily for, uh, synthetic fertilizer, but also uh, they use their own manure. Um, I'm not sure about the, the overall uh, footprint. Um, in the tool, it will be possible to, to actually calculate it because we know that enteric uh, fermentation is also an important uh, source of greenhouse gases, but I haven't done yet the, the the detailed comparison of the carbon footprint of these different forms of fertilizer. Sorry, but um, please get in touch. We can try to crack it together. Thank you. Uh, final question, are uh, soil release nitrogen mineral, mineral fertilizers welcome in Satagro or uh, uh, the only, or they are only a late problem to face ahead? Can you read again? Sorry, I didn't. Get yeah, it. it's also uh, are slow release nitrogen mineral fertilizers welcome in Satagro, or are they only a late problem to face ahead? No, this is this is good uh, good invention. Uh, they are not very popular in Poland yet because they, they are more expensive. But uh, the additions uh, which uh, slow down the release. Uh, obviously, um, improve the match between the the uh, the demand and uh, and and uh, provision of nitrogen. And actually, there are some countries which uh, 
which awarded uh, farms uh, carbon credits uh, just from uh, for switching to this technology. Okay, thank you again. Uh, I think we can move to the next presentation. Um, yes. We'll have uh, Tomislav presenting us about the soil carbon mapper and smart soil sampling. Uh, you have the link uh, that you have received in the chat, um, and I will hand the floor to um, Tomislav. I'm uh, sharing. I'm not sure I hear you or yes. if you're speaking. Yes, I'm speaking, but I don't, it looks like you don't hear me, wait. Okay, now we hear you better. You can hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay. So I shared the link. I don't have slides. I shared the link. It's kind of self-explanatory. There's lots of embedded links here. Um, so what I want to show you is the this uh, soil data cube we made for whole of Europe. And uh, we use about 200,000 uh, soil samples, uh, mainly coming from Lucas, really. It's really thanks to Lucas. So you can see all these soil samples here spread around Europe. Uh, and these soil samples are available in the space time. So they cover different periods, especially Lucas. There's a 2009, 2012, uh, 2015, 18, and there's, I think, now 2022 coming up. Uh, so they, and they will continue doing this soil sampling. And then uh, what we created. Uh, we build a space-time models and uh, we predicted the soil organic carbon space-time. Uh, we predicted also uh, soil pH, uh, ball density, uh, clay and sand content. And here you can see the predictions for the soil carbon. Um, I'm somewhere here, I'm close to Wageningen, I'm just zooming in. Um, so you can see predictions for soil carbon. Uh, we predicted uh, from 2000, 2020 uh, with a, a time block of four years. Um, and for Netherlands, there's also, I can open this, uh, every uh, parcel I can open so I can see, this is the 30 meter resolution. Um, you can see it's not, it's not perfect. I mean, the 30 meter is still a significant resolution. So uh, it will overlap with some uh, homes and uh, it will overlap. Uh, maybe some fields will be too narrow for 30 meter resolution, but overall we produce that. And this data is available uh, publicly so if you just go to the Equidata Cube, uh, now I'm looking at in the data portal, Equidata Cube, uh, and I can say, as I said, I'm somewhere here. Uh, let's try to zoom in. Um, so we are here. Um, and uh, I'm now looking at the forest and I'm looking at pH. It's a real uh, four dimensional uh, GIS. So I can scroll back through time. I can see changes of soil pH through time. Um, and I can see also changes through depth. Um, let me open also, uh, I will open the uh, soil organic carbon. So here's the soil organic carbon. The green, green is a high carbon and the reddish, uh, yellow reddish it, uh, is close to zero. If I go to deeper soil, uh, soil organic carbon drops drastically. Um, so if I, if I zoom out, for example, here in Netherlands, if I zoom out, I can see there's some places with the uh, uh, peat soils and you can see it's a much higher carbon. And in these places, even if I zoom, if I go deeper soil, there's still a significant soil organic carbon in a deeper soil. And so we, we created this prediction space time and uh, it's a really four dimensional GIS. It's for the whole of Europe, 30 meter. Uh, and um, as you can see, uh, some groups uh, starting using, it's open data, so you can download it, use it. You can make your own application. Uh, and we noticed some groups, there's a group uh, a a company, Farmon, and they made this open field. So they use our data to uh, embed in their app. Uh, so they just use a live data basically. And as I said, all of you are welcome to use this data. You can just uh, embed it. It's a cloud open initiative, it's uh, completely open. And we will uh, keep on um, improving it. We will start making a update very soon. Uh, and then based on this uh, data and models, so there are, uh, the, the whole data used to predict uh, soil organic carbon is about 20 terabyte because we have this uh, time series of uh, Landsat images. Um, and uh, once we do the predictions, then we, uh, for local farms, so somebody has a local farm, we can generate um, a sampling design. 
Uh, and this sampling design is based on this simple principle that uh, we estimate the prediction errors based on these blue points. And then we look where you have the highest prediction errors. We generate a extra sampling. So the, the black dots, they are extra samples. Um, and then we send uh, to the farmer or the landowner is sent to do sampling. And once they send us the points, then we do reanalysis and eventually the accuracy of predictions uh, gets better and better. So the, R the RMAC of uh, the uh, average error gets uh, smaller and smaller. And in that case, we can improve uh, maps for the farms and we can uh, recompute everything. So it's a very, it's a bit intensive, uh, computationally intensive, but uh, we think it's a good framework uh, and it's based on the best data for Europe. Uh, it's just, as I said, it's a large data uh, and it takes uh, takes a lot of uh, processing. Uh, it takes really serious computers to process everything. Uh, so it takes a serious infrastructure, but we would like to continue doing that uh, so we can create the most accurate uh, soil carbon data for everyone. And as I said, this data for Europe is going to stay open. Uh, we are discussing to make global soil carbon data uh, 30 meters also open. Uh, so there will be a lot of data. Just keep following us and uh, you have the contacts. So please subscribe to our channels and just follow us and there will be uh, data coming up, especially in the next one year. And with this thing, I can stop, uh, David, and uh, maybe I can answer some questions. Yes, thank you so much for this interesting presentation. Uh, we do have some questions. Um, I will start from... Um, more general questions such as where can we get parcel data uh, so if you so as i was showing here i, I can zoom in uh, i can zoom in somewhere in netherlands and there are all the uh, parcels uh, for netherlands the parcel data is public right it's a large file i mean it takes i think it's i don't know sixty thousand parcels or more uh, so it's a large file um, for other countries, I, I don't know. So you have to see with, within your country. There is some U European, I think, uh, initiative to have all the parcels uh, registered. Uh, I, I forgot the name. There's some European system. If somebody knows the name, please share. Uh, but for Netherlands, you see the parcels are publicly available. It's just I cannot, I cannot open them because it's really a huge file. Uh, it takes time to load. Uh, thank you. Uh, what is the accuracy of uh, soil organic carbon maps? Uh, the, uh, the the carbon we model in a log scale, so it's a bit abstract. Uh, it's a bit abstract what the accuracy is. We, we put it here somewhere, I think. Uh, but it's not great. It's not great. So uh, for uh, uh, detecting changes like le le for less than four years, I think I wouldn't claim changes. Um, however, when we when we block the predictions, we predicted four depths, 0, uh, 30, 60, and 100. And when we block the, when we do a block estimate, then the uncertainty is a bit uh, more narrow. Uh, so then 0 to 100 centimeter, you could also claim uh, changes for a couple of years, two, three years. Uh, for this map, we, we predict only every four, for the blocks of four years, and uh, we did it because we noticed that the interannual variability, the uncertainty was higher than the, than the actual changes between years. But for, we, that's why we took four years. So the, so the accuracy is limiting. However, when you, when you collect the data for the local farm, when you have the local farm somewhere, let's say if you have you know, like something like here, and if you collect more points here, then for that local farm, we can, for example, significantly increase uh, accuracy because we have a local point data. So that's the kind of idea. We have, in average, we have limited accuracy that is good enough for detective changes of plus minus four years. Uh, and then for local farms, if uh, users collect uh, local data, then we can uh, use that local data to uh, 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 map further accuracy of uh, carbon. Okay, perfect. I will read the last two questions uh, very fast. There are more, but we will answer afterwards or by email. Uh, very, one very straightforward question. Will the UK still be covered? UK? Yeah. Yeah, UK is covered. 
Yeah. We consider UK part of uh, Europe. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Yes. Second, uh, very straightforward. It's because, it's because the UK contributed to all Lucas. So we have all the points, Lucas points for UK. So why not map UK? Yeah. Uh, the last one is, uh, I'm also working on the same stream. Uh, can I have speaker's email uh, ID, please? Uh, we'll answer to this. Yes, of course, we received the email of uh, email addresses of the speakers so that then you can contact them uh, directly. Um, okay, uh, Celia, I will hand um, the floor back to you. Um, and thank you very much. I hope you uh, liked this technical session. Thank you. Thank you, Davide. Um, it seems that we've been going quite fast and we potentially have some more time because um, we were meaning to wrap up uh, just in, in five minutes. Um, so I wonder if potentially we could go back to Dragutin with some of the questions that came later on that we haven't had a chance to answer. Um, so for uh, example- Yes, we do have some more questions for Dragutin indeed. Um, Dragutin, would you be able to answer to a few more questions? Sure. Okay, perfect. So the, the question that was um, actually coming from John uh, was um, putting additionality to one side uh, in the scheme described, uh, do existing practices uh, qualify for credits or do you have to have additions, changes to the management practices to do so? Um, well, I'm not quite the expert for uh, interpreting the um, methodologies for generating carbon credits, but uh, general philosophy of uh, um, is that uh, you need to, to have additionality, to, so you have to change something. So, but but then uh, concept of additionality is uh, not so, let's say, concrete and strict. So it can be either your own additionality or additionality uh, related to the uh, regional conventional practices or national con uh, conventional uh, practices. So. It's not very clear, at least it's not to me, and we are learning through this project and uh, uh, I mean, mm, please be aware that uh, mm, I'm not sure that there is a single one uh, project uh, uh, based on uh, agriculture that uh, already uh, generated carbon credits, so uh, there are a number of uh, projects uh, submitted, uh, project documentation submitted and project uh, registered, but um, uh, it is question at which stage uh, these projects are. Thank you, Dragutin. Uh, we have uh, another question. Um, what algorithm do you use to calculate potential carbon sequestration? Uh, well, uh, it's still not uh, developed. Uh, we are exploring uh, various uh, uh, models, uh, CROT or Century, uh, to, to implement that as, as a way to uh, calculate potential carbon sequestration. But um, uh, I'm not sure that uh, it, it really can be a, a, a good way for, for farmer to um, explore the potential of its own land, his own land for the carbon sequestration. I think uh, that uh, uh, local experience, uh, so experience from local farmers who are already in regenerative agriculture and who monitor the changes on their land uh, for some time, I think it is a um, better way to, uh, for any farmer to understand the, the potential of uh, uh, his own land. 
Well, that is from the experience we have uh, um, uh, during uh, agriculture project. Thank you. I have another question for you, Dragutin. How is the agriculture CO2 technology account for additionality and leakage? So, um, first, uh, we are checking the history of management practices on any field uh, that is uh, uh, part of uh, the carbon credit project uh, to so to see if uh, there is a is a change and uh, we are also uh, looking at uh, the the regional um, let's say what is the um, conventional uh, management uh, in in the in the local area or the national area, so we can compare with with uh, with that. Okay, uh, if there is still time, see, I have one question for um, Shemek. Uh, we have done a thirteen-year experiment on looking at nitrogen use efficiency and nitrogen and uh, to emissions for organic amendments versus, uh, versus synthetic nitrogen. And the ratios are very different. Okay, I guess this was more a comment. Yeah, I don't know yeah, if but... uh, you agree or experience. Well, I, I was only referring to the very general, uh, um, very big generalization that that's uh, the that, can find in tier one IPCC, of course, like even even within the domain of uh, of one type of fertilizer, uh, there is a lot of variability um, because it, it depends on many aspects of of the crop culture. Um, but uh, I'd be happy to discuss your results um, if 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 there's any interest on your side. So please do get in touch. Thank you. Um, the last comment, it's not a question, but it's just to bring us to uh, bring up to our attention that in France, uh, the low carbon label finances carbon farming projects, and it's a nationwide initiative that has started a year ago. Uh, thank you, Eric. Yeah, I guess I take over from here, Davide, to, to wrap yeah, up. Yeah, please. Paper. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone who uh, followed this event today and who interacted uh, through questions uh, and maybe also on social media. Um, so as we mentioned at the beginning, we have another year uh, of this project. Uh, we've done through two and there's one more. And so as you've gathered, uh, a lot of what has been presented today is work in progress. We are still developing the solutions. Um, and so we will be presenting further what, uh, what we're doing next year. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, I think many of you already are on our mailing lists. Um, um, but if you are not yet, make sure to uh, check out the project's website. Um, it's at agricapturecu2.eu. And you can register for newsletters there. And uh, on this note, we will uh, close the meeting for today and uh, hope to see you again very soon online or maybe in person uh, in, in the coming year. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Bye.